Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Scudic Institute and Moore Auditorium. My name is Seth Benz. I'm the director of the Bird Ecology Program. And um, we <clears throat> are fortunate to have an excellent speaker from the University of Maine this evening. Alice Kelly was uh, lured here by her Maine native husband. She hails from Quakertown, Pennsylvania, which is very near to where I grew up. And she went to Lehigh University and then um, got a PhD, earned her PhD at the University of Maine. She is now an instructor in the um, uh, UMaine School of Earth and Climate Science. And she's an associate research professor in the Climate Change Institute at the University of Maine. Her topic this evening is Lost to the Sea, Maine's Ancient Coastal Heritage. Without further ado, I am going to introduce and allow us to welcome Alice Kelly. Let's see. One, uh, one item at the end, we'll have a Q&A session. And uh, if you've been here for programs before, I need to run around it and get you to speak into the microphone. So if you could hold those enthusiastic questions until I get to you, uh, we can capture it on our uh, recordings. Thank you. OK. Hi. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you to the Scudic Institute for the invitation. And uh, before I start, I'm the person here speaking. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention that this was certainly not a one-person effort. Uh, it's funded by the main Sea Grant office and also with the uh, collaboration of the Maine Historic Preservation Commission. And I have several very able co-investigators or uh, helpers in this project. Jacqueline Miller, who is our graduate student, who is working on the project as part of her uh, master's degree. Uh, my husband, Joe Kelly, who is here as a coastal geologist, Daniel Belknap, also a coastal geologist, uh, now emeritus at the University of Maine, and Arthur Spies, who is the state's um, archaeologist with the Maine Historic Preservation Commission. So what I'm going to do tonight is talk to you about our project, uh, what we've done so far, and what we hope to um, accomplish in, in the future. And I, I changed the title slightly. Um, Maine's ancient coastal heritage. I'm going to focus tonight on shell middens. This is the, the main focus of our project. And just to make sure that we're all on the same page, many of you may be very familiar with shell middens. You may have seen them, experienced them while you're walking on the beach. I thought we would just start with what is a shell midden? So shell middens or middens are human generated accumulations. They're typically the result of um, human occupation in an area and the deposition of debris of living. So in the case of shell middens, they're made up largely of shells here in Maine. They're made of either of oyster or clam shells and they're marine shells. But in other parts of the world where we have middens developed along rivers, they're freshwater shells, mussel shells on the middens on the uh, Mississippi River, for an example. So these shells are deposited by people. Frequently, we see them layered or stratified as uh, these layers as material is deposited. Sometimes we see these black layers that you might see in here, where perhaps there was a time of not people not living at that part of the midden or depositing things, or perhaps they had gone away for a while. And we see these black layers develop as, as soil layers. So primarily shells. But for the archaeological uh, record or, or archaeologists' interest, they also um, contain cultural artifacts, things that people produced as a byproduct of living in that area. So we see things like ceramics and bone material. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. And then also mixed in with these shells and with the cultural material, we also find faunal remains 
typically bones of fish or birds or mammals, um, maybe turtle remains in there, things that, that are the remains of what people were eating that were dumped in with this, this midden. Now, Maine has a lot of shell middens. We have a long coast, and I just put up some details there. We know of slight, over 2,000 middens on the Maine coast. And if we use a coastline length of uh, 5,000 kilometers, that comes out to one midden every 400 meters. So they're rather common on the coast. What we see is sometimes they are accumulated. There'll be one on either side of a bay where there was a rich source of shellfish. Um, on some rocky coastline stretches, we won't see them because the resource wasn't there. But of course, we have many islands on the main coast, and many of those islands also host these shell middens. The largest shell midden in Maine is the Glidden Midden. It's uh, near Damariscotta, Maine. And it is, in fact, the largest e existing midden north of Florida. So go to Damariscotta, drive over the Route 1 bridge, take a look right on the one side, and you'll see this one area right here. The white area is just the glimpse of the eroding side of the shell midden. But this whole forested area all along here is all one large deposit of shells, things that were dumped time after time over thousands of years of people living in this area. So when we look at these archaeological sites, what we see are 4,000 years of cultural record. So 4,000 years of people living on the coast. So what do we have in here besides these shells? The shells tell us what they were eating, but we also have the remains of ceramics. People here were using the local glacial marine clay, tempering it with either shell pieces or sand to create pottery. And we see the fragments of those, that pottery in these shell mints. We also see the tools that they were making out of stone. And at this time, it was primarily chipstone tools Things like these uh, projectile points and hand tools that we find, and archaeologists refer to these as lithic artifacts, meaning that they're made out of stone. We also find bone tools and uh, artifacts in shell middens. And this is part of the really important part to our archaeological history of the Maine coast is the preservation of these bone tools and bone artifacts. Because Maine has acidic soils. So if we go virtually any place in Maine, except for a shell midden, if organic material is buried, is there as a remains of an archaeological site and occupation thousands of years ago, all of the organic material is gone. We may see bits of bone if it was burned, in a fire, but the rest of the material has dissolved and is removed. And so the only place on the main coast, and this is true for New England and the Maritimes as well, uh, the only place that we see this bone technology, the things that people were, were making out of the bones that animals that they captured or the shells that, that they were using are preserved in shell middens. So without that information, we would have one whole part of that lifestyle would be missing. And in fact, when we looked at archaeological sites in the inland portions of the state and of this region, we don't see any of that. We see ceramics, we see lithic artifacts, but not those, those bone tools. And so we assume that people there were using them, but they weren't preserved. And when we think about these sites, we typically think about Native Americans. The indigenous people were here prior to European contact and, and at the time of European contact. And so this is what we often think about when we think about shell mittens. But from work that's been done by University of Maine researchers and students, we found that use of these shell mittens as a place to put material as a dump, and we can talk about what happens later, um, this dump is, is 
also carries right up through the contact period. So if we go to a site in uh, down east Maine, uh, right next to the Native American material and stratigraphically above it, so, so stratigraphically younger, they found uh, evidence of a 17th century French occupation. Um, the jar is a dead ringer for ones that were produced in France, um, appear in paintings of the time, and in fact are in museums in France. Also associated with that jar were some plum pits. Plums weren't growing in Maine at that time, not uh, the kind of fruit trees that we know as plum trees. So here we had the evidence of fruit that was picked and preserved in France, brought all the way to the New World, and it ended up in this midden. In the same midden, we see the change of occupation, the whole history of the area. As uh, in a different part of the midden, they found 18th century English artifacts. And here, um, the prime artifact is not so glamorous as a, a cross um, or a piece of fine pottery. It's uh, a bit of an English chamber pot. But there it is. So not only is, is there cultural material, but there's also a rich archive of paleo-environmental information in these middens as well. Um, it is a somewhat biased sample, because these were only things that people were eating, things that people were using. Uh, but it is a record of what animals were living in the western Gulf of Maine 4,000 years ago when no one was keeping written records to tell us what was there. So by looking at the faunal remains associated in these middens, uh, we see this, this preservation that we see nowhere else. We can get an idea of species presence or absence to try and track the movement of various types of animals. We get an idea of seasonality, when were animals in certain places, and we can also use that seasonality information as a way to understand when people were at on the coast using these middens at various times of the year, and also changing population dynamics of the various species in the Gulf of Maine. One of the things that uh, people have looked at are swordfish. We find swordfish remains in middens. Uh, we know that during the Archaic period, uh, 5,000, 4,000 years ago, people um, became interested in swordfish. And in fact, they used the, the beaks or the bills on the swords of the fish appear to have had a, some ritual significance. We find them in burials. But we also see them in middens, and here is a piece of a swordfish sword sticking out of a shell mitt. And by knowing the size of the sword, uh, biologists who um, study fish can make some estimates about the size of the animal. And it turns out that 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, these things were really got to be really big. We also get some information on animals that are no longer present on the coast of Maine. Um, if we look in these shell middens going from 4,000 years up to uh, contact, what we see are the remains of lots of animals that we would recognize, but also some that are extinct. And one of them is the sea mink. Sea mink were here, I think, until the 1800s. They were extirpated, but we see them in, uh, remain in, in the shell middens and also often in um, contexts that suggest that perhaps these had some special meaning to the people who were collecting them. These three upper jaws uh, came out of one small place associated with a few other objects that suggested to the archaeologists that this may have been maybe a, a medicine bag or a special, something that was very special to someone that they had, had put in with uh, some other objects. We also see evidence of the great auk, which was a large alcid that was present here on the coast, again, extirpated after contact. But these appear frequently in shell middens. And without this information, uh, we would not be able to put together so much about their range and their biology and, 
uh, their seasonality. So shell middens have been on the coast, I said, for, for 4,000 years. And uh, we, we see that people, we as a group, are very good at making use of resources. And when we think about the things that have endangered shell middens, I've talked about um, you know, them lost to the sea, shell middens. So you can see that we're, we're moving towards something of a, a loss of these these features, well, people have had a hand for quite a while. Um, early on, as, as people came to this area and began to farm, they realized that these accumulations of shell provided a ready source of lime. They could either simply pulverize the stones and, or the shells and put them on their, on their fields, um, or they can heat it and turn it into lime. Uh, so this was done frequently. I've read about people using the shells from shell middens for their, uh, in their apple orchards uh, because apple trees like alkaline soils. And in fact, often we see apple orchards associated with shell middens. Um, people had made that, that connection. But in the late 1800s, um, the mining of these things went large scale. And this is a picture of what was the largest midden in Maine, again, north of Florida. It's on the opposite side of the river from the Glidden Midden, which still stands there today. But this midden was largely mined, uh, first for lime, and then to be ground up and used in chicken feed. So in 1886, for a matter of several years, a company went at this. They shipped out over 200 tons of crushed shell to the poultry industry in New England. And at the same time, a um, archaeologist was busily trying to collect the bits and pieces. Those now reside in uh, the Harvard Museum. And uh, so much of what we know about early shell middens came from him trying to stay ahead of the, the workers with the pickaxes and and the horses to um, preserve this material. But development pressure obviously hasn't ended. It's just a little different. Uh, this picture is from Wells, Maine. If you've uh, been to the southern part of the coast, it may be a familiar site. Uh, this is a um, vacation home or, or um, you know, hotel complex that sits on the site of a midden. Um, it was, I think, constructed in the 80s. And uh, it's, it's there on the midden now. We can't see it. And of course, anything that might have been out on the barrier island is completely covered by, by people. Uh, earlier in this, sum this year, in the summer, I gave a talk in Wells, Maine. And I talked about this project. And they said, well, we're going to have a field trip in the afternoon. Uh, wouldn't you like to take a group of people to see a midden? And you could take your equipment and you know, do, a, a, do a little show and tell. And I thought that sounded like a lovely idea. Um, but I, I hadn't done much work in this area. And I, I didn't know of any shell middens. I couldn't think of any. And so I contacted my friends who are archaeologists said, you know, I need, I, I'd like to have a shell midden we can go and visit. And they said, no, nah, not unless you go out to one of the islands. And people were living here 4,000 years ago. They were using clams, just like the folks were in the other parts of the main coast. But either those middens have been removed, or they're covered with buildings now. And so we don't see that we've lost that cultural record in that part of the state. So where do we see shell middens? What are the settings? And basically, the first requirement is that we need to have a place with shellfish, a tidal flat that's going to produce clams or oyster accumulations that people can harvest oyster from, oysters from. So here's the Glen Midden. That situation is next to um, old oyster reefs on the Damariscotta River. Uh, we also see middens right at the shore's edge. 
Um, so in a, a kind of a low relief setting, and here you can see the white band here is the mark of the shells eroding out of the midden here. Uh, we also see them on bluff tops. Again, whoa, sorry. Um, here you also see this white streak or the whiteness on the beach here as a result of the shells coming out from the top of the bluff. And then sometimes we see them here on perched right on bedrock. Um, but sometimes we know that they're gone. They've been entirely eroded. Sea level is rising. Sea level is operating um, along each of these, these faces, either on the river or along uh, these bluffs, particularly when we have winter storms with very energetic waves. Um, they, they eat away at, the, at these uh, features. And in the case of this one, which was on a bedrock location in southern Maine, uh, we went out with the state archaeologist when we were first developing this project. And he said, well, I have one in southern Maine. I know they're hard to find, but I've got one. I was there in the late 70s. It's great. It's perfect for your project. I'll set everything up with the state park. And so we got all the permits that were required to be in the non-public part of the state park and to drive on their dirt roads and to get in. And so we get there, and we're all set to go. And he got there, and he had his map, and he had his clipboard with his whole description. And there was nothing left. It's rather exposed to waves, and it's gone. So sometime between the late 70s and last since two summers ago, it was completely gone. We couldn't even find bits of shells left on that beach. We know we had the right place. We had a map. He'd been there. He had photographs. And with uh, coastal erosion, it is completely gone. And so this is what brings me to our project, in that we know we have, or think we have, 2,000 of these features. We know that they hold a long record of human occupation on the main coast. We know they also have a paleo-environmental archive of the western Gulf of Maine. So they have a lot that they can tell us. But we also know that they've been mined, they've been covered, they've been exploited by people who like to dig them up and take arrowheads home which may be a wonderful occupation, but those arrowheads go into a cigar box or sit up on a mantle, and they're no, they, they can't tell a story to anyone other than the story of the day they were found. They're completely out of context. And so we're losing these features. And we know we're, as, as sea level rise is continuing, we're going to lose them even more rapidly. So what to do? We know that they have 4,000 years of, of cultural his, history. And the question that somebody in this audience is probably wondering is, so only 4,000 years? Weren't people here much longer than that? I thought I knew about Paleo-Indians. And why is it these Shelmans only do 4,000 years? Maybe they're not that special. Well, the story of why we, they only are 4,000, only 4,000 years old, has to do with Maine's sea level history. Researchers at the University of Maine, Joe Kelly, Dr. Craig Shipp, he was in the audience, uh, were early on and, and worked with many other people, Dan Belknap and, and lots of students, to develop an understanding of how relative sea level has changed, how sea level has changed with respect to the land surface here in the coast of Maine since deglaciation. And this is why our middens are only tell us something about 4,000 years ago. If I go back to the time of when the ice sheets were retreating from the coast of Maine, that ice had so much mass that it could press down on the Earth's crust and actually depress it. And we don't think about 
water having mass or ice having mass, but anyone who's carried a cooler full of ice knows that there's some, ice, some mass there. So if you pile up kilometers of ice, you have a pressure pushing down. And underneath the rigid crust, there's a plastic material that oozes out away from it. And so as the ice sheet was retreating from the coast of Maine at about 4,000 years ago, it's pressing down on the surface. And so the ocean, even though sea level at the time was lower, the ocean is following it in. And it follows it in as far as Millinocket in the Penobscot drainage and Bingen in the Connecticut. So if we look at probably the area around here, maybe 13,000 years ago, give or take a few, this is probably what it looked like. This could have been Cadillac Mountain with pack ice, ice out in front of it. And I'm using a cartoon by a group of Canadian researchers. I put the coast of Maine on here, and you can see that here's the present day coast. And this was the extent of sea level into that area. Well, as the ice retreated and it melted, the land surface no longer had that weight on it, and it began to um, come back up. And as it was coming up, it was moving up faster than sea level was rising. And so the land surface appeared to rise fat or did rise faster. And we ended up with a time period, a very short amount of time, around 12,000 years ago, where our coastline was at a point now where we think is about 60 meters below present. So the real estate of subaerial Maine was larger 12,000 years ago than it is today. And if you look closely on here, I tried to keep it to scale. You can see here's our present day coast, and it's green out here. So were people there? P quite possibly. We know that there were people in Nova Scotia at this time um, at Paleo-Indian sites. We have evidence of some Paleo-Indians down here at uh, 12,000 years ago in Massachusetts. More than likely, they were here. But if they were here, that area very quickly was submerged again as sea level caught up with the land surface and, in fact, started rising against the land and to the present day. If we look on this off the coast of Maine, fishers have brought up artifacts that we recognize as Native American artifacts. Here's a, a large projectile point, a ground stone tool. This may have been used for woodworking. This has a narrow, sharp bit on the end. They're in good shape. They haven't been banged up a lot by being washed in the surf. We could say that these things just fell out of a boat 1,000 or 9,000 years ago, and they've been sitting on the ocean floor since then. But in the area that they were found, just off of Bass Harbor at Acadia, um, at about the right depth, at 20 meters below present, um, they, their age matches this 8,000, so early archaic time period, if we use the archaeologist scale for when people were here. And then work by, again, Joe Kelly, and as some of his, his co-workers found that in the area where these artifacts were found, there had once been a lake. It was in between these two spits here, but this was terrestrial and was a lake. It then became an estuary. And then eventually, as sea level was rising, it overtopped this area. So it's quite possible that although they didn't find the intact site, there have been a midden there? Very possibly. Uh, no evidence, but I would say it, it's, it's at least possible, if not probable. So then if we look at this curve and, oh, sorry, we see how it's 
continuing, sea level is rising, and it's coming up to the present, if we plot the location of our remaining Sheldons, they're all here in this 4,000 year to, to present time period. There may well have been ones out here at 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, perhaps even longer, but they've all been eroded as sea level is rising, and then whatever material remains has been submerged. So this is what we've got left of the coastal archaeological record. So this is where we got was background to our project. So we knew that we, these, these sites are disappearing. There are 2,000 of them. It's really hard to visit them all, almost impossible. So how do you make a decision where you're going to put your emphasis? What do you, how, how do you decide? And so we suggested uh, to Sea Grant, and they thought it was a good idea, was to try and use ground penetrating radar. Here we use GPR as, as the shorthand for that. It's a geophysical tool as a, very, as a rapid, non-invasive way without digging to try and lay out, get an understanding for the size of what is left at some of these middens. Uh, we're gonna, we looked at examining shoreline change to try and understand the rate at which these middens are disappearing, and then to try and develop a strategy to bring in citizen science to try and, and aid in data recovery and monitoring of these disappearing resources. And tonight I'm going to talk about one and, and three. So I'd like to first talk about this idea of using this geophysical tool as a way to, to get a handle on what we've got left. Now, people have used ground penetrating radar to examine shell middens. That's not new. But they have never been used on a broad scale, or it's never been used on a broad scale as a cultural resource management tool. So that was the new part. Why use ground penetrating radar? Why not just have an excavation? I mean, after all, you learn so much. Well, you do. But there are some problems with excavation. If you look at all of those buckets, and you look at all of those people, it takes a lot of time and effort to do this. A lot of people, a lot of time, and you need to, be, to, to take the time to be absolutely meticulous, because every time you excavate a site, you destroy it. It's gone. So you need to record everything in such a way so that you can, at least on paper, or perhaps on computer, put it back together again for, for archaeologists in the future. So because of the expense and the time, perhaps two or maybe three excavations happen each year or every other year. That's not going to tell us much about 2,000 middens. So we bring in our equipment, and this is a, one of several varieties of ground penetrating radar uh, tools that you can use. And basically, what we have here is a transmitter and a receiver in this orange box. And it looks like a baby stroller, because it is. It's a modified baby carriage uh, with a little computer up here with a screen on the top. And what we do with this is it sends an electrical signal. It's uh, battery powered sends an electrical signal down into the ground, radio frequency waves, and those waves then reflect off of differences in electrical properties of the soil. Now those things like grain size, composition, water content, all can influence the electrical properties. So it comes off of those, those layers. So we're seeing each layer has, a, has a, a reflection. It comes back into the receiver here, travels up through a cable, and is displayed on, this, uh, on the screen up here. Each time a pulse goes into the ground, uh, the signal is returned as, as one of these individual wavelets. 
but the signals are going in thousands of times a, a second, and as there, we put them together and we produce a profile or a, an image of the subsurface that looks something like this. Now we can see some things immediately on here. You can see there's a contact here, but then you know, there's a lot of you know, signal fades down here. It's, it, we lose it, and then if we have these big, strong bands. This is the energy traveling directly from the transmitter to the receiver. It doesn't have to go very far. It just <coughs> zips across the soil, so it's at the top. And also, with this instrument, no matter what kind of terrain you're going on, uphill and down, it always records it as if it's a flat surface like, like a table. So then we process this in the lab to try and, and bring out more information and we hope come get a little bit more out of this. Um, here's our signal. We record it. Oh, we're recording the information in the amount of travel, how long it takes for the wave to travel to a certain layer and then come back. We refer to that as two-way travel time. Happens in nanoseconds, so extremely quickly. And then by knowing something about the, the soil, the subsurface that we're dealing with, we can make some estimates about, about depth. So we take our, our raw line um, and we do a little bit of processing. We do some filtering. Um, we try and bring out the signal at, at the top here that seems to be quite faint. We get rid of these bands. So that's processing. We take that and then after we've tweaked it so that we can see enough of, of as much of the information as we can, we then introduce topography from topographic surveyed elevations that we've taken along each one of these lines. This, the, the collecting the data in the field is fairly rapid. You can collect it at a slow walking pace as you move across, as you push that stroller across the surface of the archaeological site or the shell midden. Um, doing this processing takes about twice as long. Uh, to, to do it. So there's some time in the field and time in the lab. If you've watched uh, CSI and they bring ground penetrating radar out to look for the body that's buried in the basement or under the slab and they push it over and say, oh yeah, there it is. Yeah, sorta. <laughs> we, we've done some work with the state police and yeah, you can get some information, but you're, you're not going to bring in the backhoe on uh, just the basis of that, that raw data. So you need to do some processing as well. So once you've got this processed record, what do you do with it? Well, you can make this nice profile, and our interest was to be able to identify shell midden on these profiles. And what we found was, yeah, we could look at this, and here you see the line has been drawn on here to show basically the bottom of the shell mid. But how can you be sure? I mean, really. You can't. Well, this is why, as because this is a test, we've gone to sites where we have exposures and known some limited archaeological information. Here we are at one of the, a, shell, a small shell midden in the Damariscotta region. This is an, an oyster midden right here. And so we can see from this eroded face, this is our state archaeologist, see from this eroded face that we can get an idea of the thickness of that uh, shell midden layer, and we know where we are on the profile. So we can have an estimate, or what we call ground truth, but to take that a step further is if you're hanging everything on just one exposure right at the eroding edge, we've gone to places that have limited archaeological excavations. They couldn't excavate the whole midden, but they did do some work. And here, um, Jackie has taken a hand-drawn archaeological profile and, and made it look rather nice. Um, what these various layers are showing you are different concentrations of shell, shell mixed with sediment, um, 
the crushed shell at the top, and then that this was sitting on um, a clay silt. We know that that's the glacial marine deposit. So we know on our ground penetrating radar profile where that the edge of that excavation unit um, was located, and so we can match up, well, what we want to do is match up this profile with this um, GPR profile, the archaeological section. Now, you would hope that there would be a one-to-one -one, um, correlation. We do see, we can see this sloping layer. I think this is what we're seeing here. Uh, marine clay beneath it. This is the shell. Whoops up. But it's not, we, you know, you look at this and you don't see, see it exactly in there. Why not? Because this is based on electrical properties. This is visual. The two are very close, but they aren't exact. Also, here we have someone who was sitting and drawing this profile with their nose probably about four inches from the section. Here we're looking with uh, electrical radi radar waves into the ground, and we can't get the fine detail resolution that we see here. But we got what we needed. We could identify, we can confidently identify um, deposits of shell in these shell middens so that we can construct the lateral extent and the thickness of these shell middens. This is another one just as an example, and I will admit that I'm showing you our very best stuff, but this is, this is a midden that is on an island um, south of here. It's a midden that sits almost directly on top of bedrock. Um, and so, and there had been an archaeological excavation. Uh, we have shell, a layer of black soil at the base sitting on bedrock. Uh, we use the same colors in the stratigraphic section as we do in the ground penetrating radar section. And we have great agreement between these particularly for this shell layers here, the shell layers here, and so we feel that we can pretty confidently um, use this to lay out the, the size of the shellman without having to put a shovel in the ground except for these few places where we have some ground truth. So what do we do? That's how you do it on one profile, but one profile doesn't tell you about the whole shellman. So here's a site that we did um, in Midcoast, Maine. It was the first one that we went out to work on, and we knew that there was some, uh, had been some archaeological excavations, and we got a bit carried away. Um, these are one meter uh, grids, so one meter, each one of those profiles is a meter apart, uh, both in the east-west and the north-south direction, we refer to pushing the instrument back and forth as mowing the lawn. It feels very much like walking behind a lawnmower. And after two days of survey, we realized that um, we needed to get on with it, and the project was really to delineate this feature, and so then we spread out into uh, a bit broader grid. I'm gonna show you first a line from a profile where that red line is. So this was the kind of record that we received from there. Um, you know, if, if first cut does not look maybe too exciting, here is the stratigraphic section with uh, some interesting archaeology Oops, down in this area. When we did processing and interpretation, we felt that we could, uh, we have a could define the shell midden layer, and we're seeing kind of that convoluted surface there. So we were not exactly on the profile, but very uh, the stratigraphic profile, but very close to it. So doing profile after profile after profile being um, processed and analyzed in this way, we could put together um, along each one of these lines a profile which was then put into a 
a computer program that allowed us to create a map. Geologists call this an isopack map, meaning that it's a thickness map of the midden. So what we see here from analyzing all of those profiles is that uh, we were working within the areas suggested to us by the archaeologists, is that in fact the midden extends well beyond where they thought the, the original plans were, that it extended, that the thickest areas are off here on the edge. So if we wanted to look at the highest potential for recovering cultural remains or faunal remains out of the shells, that it's very likely here in the area that is most likely to disappear in the next severe winter storm, but that it extends uh, quite far back. Each one of these squares is 10 meters, so this is a 40 meter uh, distance from here to back here. So by doing this at a number of sites, we can give the archaeologists some basis to make decisions about where they want to put their precious time and human resources into um, trying to preserve these. So the next part of our project, I'm going to skip over the shoreline change, and is that the, we were supposed to, to work on developing some kind of strategy to address this idea of the data loss in these eroding shell middens. <clears throat> We had a meeting in mid-August at the Darling Center, uh, University of Maine's uh, coastal facility, and we brought together representatives of state government, um, land trusts, other interested people, um, act people who study, archaeologists who study shell middens, and we posed this problem. What are, what are we going to do about this? We can't do this professionally don't have enough time, we don't have enough people, and mostly we don't have enough resources to try and do large-scale excavations all along the main coast. So to summarize our, our findings at the meeting, uh, we went in the field one day, we had a sit-down meeting the next, we had people from uh, Europe where there are several steps ahead of us on, on cultural heritage preservation, give some talks, and we came up with these results that we do all agree they're valuable cultural and paleo-environmental information. Uh, some people there knew of them only as archaeological resources. The idea of the paleo-environmental component was, was new and exciting for them. Um, that monitoring, that knowing what we have and what, what we're losing, how fast we're losing it, is important. and the time to act is now. It's happening. And who knows how much we're going to lose when a winter storm comes in. Each midden is in a slightly different location. They may not all be damaged by a storm, but depending on the orientation where those waves are coming from, it is not surprising in a big storm to, move, to lose up to a meter off of the front of these middens. And once it's on the beach, it's worked by the waves, and we've lost the information. So we talked about monitoring, and we've come up with the idea that groups would be good, um, something working through a land trust, um, a conservation association, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, group of people who would be interested to working together. Um, it could be done by individuals, somebody who has a camp somewhere, that boat somewhere, that um, say fishers who go through past certain islands with middens would be really um, useful. And so, but to do this, we have to develop some sort of training. Everybody needs to know some basics about archaeology, about the things they're going to be seeing, some basics about geology, coastal processes, how to describe things in a language that everyone, a geologist and the people who be working with this can understand. And also the idea of photography, of repeat of photographic records of these places, spring and fall. What happened? What's the situation in the fall before the winter storms? Then in the spring, what happened over the winter? 
And that photography can be either still camera, drones. We've been doing some experimenting with trying to use multiple photographs of one area to build a 3D model through structured promotion. So there are a lot of possibilities for where we can go in bringing people into um, this project. So what would we do with our monitoring? Uh, first visit would be baseline conditions. In fact, is the midden still there? We thought it was we had one there, but is it still there? Um, repeat visits. What's changing? What is the condition? Is the site being eroded? Was there a big storm? Has a looter come in and decided that they're going to dig it up? What, what's going on at each of these, these places? The spring and fall photography to try and monitor how, what processes and at what rates are things happening? And then finally, to develop a data repository, a place where this information can be held and it can be shared. Um, our model is what's being done in Scotland, where they have a dedicated office and website to bring in information. People take pictures on their cell phones. They type in some information. It comes to one place, and it's all recorded there and then shared. Uh, data recovery sometimes called rescue excavations, where something is imminent that it's going to be damaged, as it looks like erosion, things, a block is going to go in. Uh, field schools operated through universities. There are some volunteer excavations that happen through the main uh, Historic Preservation Commission, working with land trusts on individual sites. So they are rare because of the expense involved and, and the logistics and putting lots of people in the field for a week or two, but they do happen. And this is, again, an important part of the story. So if you're interested and or you know someone who's interested, <coughs> um, I'm the contact person for monitoring. We're just starting. Um, the uh, Island Institute featured our project in the Working Waterfront. If you get the Working Waterfront, you may have read our, our, about our project. Um, I have been getting about three to five emails a day from people who've read the article and said, sounds neat, I'd like to help. So over the winter, we're going to start developing how we're going to uh, take advantage of, of, of this interest and move forward. This is not part of our Sea Grant project, so it'll start slowly and we'll be looking for funding to to take it to the next level. If you're interested in the data recovery side of things, the uh, volunteer um, excavations, the Maine Archaeological Society is probably your best contact to what's going on in the field in the summer. Um, if you become a member, um, I, it, membership is certainly not outrageous. They publish these things in their newsletter, and um, you, can, you can get in touch with them. So at that point, um, I'll answer questions. Okay. Questions? Anyone? Hi. Well, that's a beautiful, clear field there. Isn't that lovely? Uh, I can think of places where there might be some potential, but who's going to clear the field to get that baby buggy in there? And I mean, just the decision to uh, uh, you know get the baby buggy level going is okay. uh, a major financial undertaking right there. Well, you know that picture I showed you of the Glidden Midden. With all those well, trees on top. If you know there's a midden, then you're good. We did some clipping and we did ground penetrating radar on there. It was it was challenging, but we did it. Um, yes, there are middens that aren't fields. It is a happy coincidence of 19th century farming that the farmers recognized that these things were really good agricultural sites. And so the large middens tend to have fields on top of them. But yes, I have been um, in Sip Bay, and it's just north of here, 
And uh, there are a lot of middens as you walk along the bluff. You can see shells moving out, and it's completely forested. Um, it was interesting that those were old farms that are now grown over. But yeah, um, there are there. The way that, that you, if you're doing coastal survey to identify them at that point, um, I guess the idea that we're looking at is we're trying to make triage decisions. It's also much easier to excavate in something that looks like this than in the midst of trees. Um, and many landowners aren't thrilled when you start cutting down trees or damaging roots. So, it, yes, some will be missed. And getting to islands, really hard. So in those cases, it may just be monitoring. Having somebody keeping an eye every month, every two months, spring and fall, you know, to keep an eye on what's happening there. And if it looks really important, then to make the effort to go. So how many sites have you done with this ground penetrating Trading radar? radar. Uh, we have done six sites starting. Our southernmost is uh, in Biddeford. And we've worked up through down east Maine. We haven't quite gotten to this area. We'd still like to go to one um, near Pembroke. I know of a project that was undertaken at Scudic some time ago, but I don't think much came of it. There is a shell midden at Fraser Point. Yes. And we actually, we, Joe and I were part of a, ran a, a initial bluff survey. Up, so you may have seen us out there with survey equipment, mm -hmm. and that may be the one you're thinking of. We were looking at how rapidly these, these shorelines are changing. Any other questions? Oh boy. Very interesting. <laughs> um, I'm really interested in, um, in your 4,000 years to present, your slow stay in time period. Do you see any correlatable stratigraphy by species? Do you see the species changing with time in the midden, and can you see that someplace aerially separated? Um, well, I am not a biologist, so I don't do that work. But I have read about it. It's kind of like I got a good night's sleep, and I can tell you about it. <laughs> but um, yes, they do see particularly um, size of individuals you know, pre-fishing, because this is pre-industrial fishing. I mean, when the Basques and the English hit this part of the world, they really started fishing on a big side. Size of cod, um, size of swordfish. One of the interesting things is to look at um, the, really the oldest stuff, the 4,000 years ago, when things were supposed, were supposed to be a bit warmer, and then what happened as, as uh, things cooled. And I know that there has been some talk among some of the folks in marine sciences about doing that, but I don't know how much of that work has been done. But one of the other things is that only a very few ar archaeologists save the complete section of faunal material. And we, one person started to go back and look at the little tiny fish bones. And there, as I'm thinking about it, they did start to see some changes in some of the, the small fish, the prey fish, um, when they were coming in and going out. But I don't remember the details. Anyone else? Nope. OK. Well, thank you very much, sure. Alice. Fascinating. Um, thank you all for coming out. And um, just a couple reminders on um, the 19th of October, we will have a brown bag um, lunch here. And um, our forest ecologist, Dr. Nick Fiscicelli, will be speaking on standardized tests for trees. So you may want to come out and. Uh, check that out. 
And um, ongoing these days, uh, there is a sea watch for monitoring migrating waterfowl, all kinds of seabirds, including alcids, though I doubt that we'll ever see a great auk again. Um, we do see razorbills. Um, passing right by Scudic Point, that's happening every day from sunrise to about 9.30, 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, last year, we saw 100,000 birds in two months. This year, due to fog, we're not seeing as many, but there are birds passing by. So we appreciate your um, support of the Scudic Institute programs. Hope to see you out here again for something in the near future. Thanks very much. Have a safe drive home. And thank you, Alice, again.